This week on The Big Show, we continue our celebration of Black women directors in the month of September with emerging director Melissa Hazlip. Show correspondent Wilson Morales will join us to recap the week in entertainment, plus we'll have reviews of the, Net, the Netflix new release, Cuties, as well as the sit-in Harry Belafonte hosts The Tonight Show, all on episode 416 of Keeping It Real with Film Gordon. Let's go. All right, and welcome to the latest episode of The Big Show, Keeping It Real with Film Gordon. Uh, Charles Kirkland, my co-host, joins me. Charles, what's going on? What's happening, Tim? I'm glad to be here. All right, brother. I'm glad you're here as well. And today on our show, our special guest will be director Melissa Hazlett, uh, the director of Mr. Soul, as we continue our celebration of Black women directors. Uh, Wilson Morales, as I said at the top, is going to join us momentarily to give us the 411 on the weekend entertainment. And there are two new releases that I want to review a little later on in the show. And of course, that is uh, a film that's causing a lot of controversy for Netflix right now, Cuties, and the film that I've been looking forward to for a minute uh, from Peacock. And of course, that is the sit-in. Harry Belafonte hosts The Tonight Show. Um, it's kind of ironic that we have that film is going to be reviewed today because Melissa Hazlip's film, Mr. Soul, there are some parallels to both these stories. And both of them were pieces of history that I was not familiar with. So as a history buff and uh, a, a real purveyor of Black culture and a purveyor of Black film, this is like a perfect kind of convergence for me of all of talking about all this stuff, Charles. This is going to be a lot of fun on today's show. I'm excited to have her on the show. We could talk with her about Mr. Soul. That's going to be cool. Absolutely, man. Now, as you remember last week, Charles, we continue our celebration of Black women directors this week with Zora Neale Hurston, best known for her novels, including the renowned Their Eyes Were Watching God. Hurston was a Fort Loris who, a uh, oh, folklorist, excuse me, who created work centering on ethnographic films. She created the film Children's Games in 1928, which is the first non-silent film to be directed by a black woman. Hurston was trained as an anthropologist, uh, anthropo anthropologist, oh, thank you, and <laughs> created documentaries, blah, blah, excuse me, particularly about the lives of black people in the South. Now, in addition to Zora Neale Hurston, we salute Alois King Patrick Giss, who produced short religious films with her husband, James Giss, including the 16-minute silent motion picture, Hellbound, in 1929-1930, whenever they want to give us a release date, which preached temperance. Uh, Alois Giss, Giss' work had a spiritual mission and remains unique in the explicitly non-theatrical definition and its purpose as a tool for moral education and social uplift. Now, we're gonna continue, because I, I got, a, I got a, a plan in mind. As Londa Good Robeson, better known as the author of Paul Robeson's Negro, the biography of her husband and the travelogue, The African Journey, shot ethnographic film coverage during the 1940s. Uh, this material has been held at the Library of Congress as of 2010, but not available for public screening due to fragile conditions. And finally, we put a spotlight on Madeline Anderson, who is considered a trailblazer in the world of nonfiction filmmaking, uh, recognized particularly for I Am Somebody, released in 1970, and earlier, a tribute to Malcolm X in 1967, man. So wanted to make sure that as we talk to uh, female working black directors, fem women directors now, that we also tie it in with the history of whence the, the shoulders that they stand on, man. And, they, and, you know, we don't, you know, these names that I'm giving out are not household names. Like we talk about Spencer Williams and we talk about Oscar Michaud and we talk about other, you know, pioneering black filmmakers who were men during that time period, I think we need to kind of even that that playing field. And if we're giving Oscar Michelle love, we need to give these other ladies who were vital in the early pioneering days of some, in some instances, silent films, as well as 
they called them talkies in the late 20s and 1930s. So, Charles, well, comments on any of this? It's really cool. Like you said, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, I mean, many people know that name. And I'm not sure too many people know that she was a director, that she had done any films of any sort, because mostly it's about her books. Uh, and especially, like you said, their eyes were watching God. And so uh, it, it, I think it's a wonderful thing that we get to honor these ladies who did so much work in pioneering the field of female directors. And um, I think it's also interesting to note that um, with tonight, today's guest, I mean, and not today's guest, but today's recognition, and last week, a lot of these people are starting through the church, uh, and that they get in their, their starts there to um, discover about how to make these films. And, and uh, I, the Black African church, I mean, the African American church has been instrumental in so many uh, aspects of our lives today, and it, it's really cool to see how film was also part of that legacy. All righty, and you're absolutely right, and we will have more of these salutes in the coming weeks, as well as more of these guests that are coming up that we'll announce later on in the show. But right now, we're going to go to New York, and uh, we're going to interrupt uh, the, the, the man who has been screening films from the Toronto International Film Fest all week. It is none other than uh, our show correspondent, one of the best working critics that I know who, who covers entertainment on a daily basis. He is the publisher, creator of blackfilmandtv.com. It is none other than Wilson Morales. Wilson, welcome to the show. Hey, welcome. I uh, just want to correct you and say I have not been screening films from the festival because I was not given credentials this year. <laughs> I, like some other people, you know, so I want to say that, which is surprising. Wilson is like, uh-uh, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that indeed. You know, for whatever reason, you know, uh, obviously this year is different. They give, they've give, they given uh, a, a lesser amount of credentials this year, and there are colleagues of mine. They're attending the festival virtually. And, um, and fortunately, you know, some of us have been able to get links <laughs> from publicists, but I am not covering the festival so much this year. All right. Um, were they scared, I, well, I was just, were they scared I, that Corona would go through the wires or something that, that <laughs> I don't understand? I, I said, this, I don't, how, this is how you clean it up. Look, I assume since <laughs> you're always covering the festival. I did, like you know. I'm always covering the festival. I'm not covering it this year either. So I was hoping somebody I knew was covering it. You know, I was like, I'm, I'm looking around the web to see, like, is there anybody or any article out there highlighting uh, the Black films at the festival that's there? And I, I couldn't find any. You know, it's easy to point out the Regina King movie. And, you know, obviously I'm not, you know, let's just go into some of the movies because at the end of the day, you know, it's all about highlighting filmmakers and talent regardless of what happens to us as press. So right. that being said, you know, this is the week where festivals are now starting to come up. You know, you just recently had Venice. Now you have Toronto. Then you're going to have uh, New York. And within the Toronto film, Venice, actually, you had Regina King's One Night in Miami that's gotten stellar reviews. And, you know, it's a standout for all four actors that are in the movie. Uh, Kingsley ben uh Eli Gorey, Leslie Odom Jr., and Aldous Hodge, you know, telling a story of what could have happened when Miami and Ali met one night with uh, Jim Brown, Malcolm X, and Sam Cooke. So she's been getting rave reviews. Um, another movie that's being appearing at the festival is Concrete Cowboy, which is uh, produced by Lee Daniels. Among he's one of the producers, and Idris Elba, and starring Idris Elba, Caleb McLaughlin from Stranger Things and uh, um, the kid who won the, uh, the Emmy for Best Actor from When They See Us. Um, I forgot his name. <laughs> Jarrell Jerome. Jarrell Jerome, along with Lorraine Toussaint and Method Man. So it's rare that we see, like, I wouldn't say a Western movie, but, you know, uh, blacks in co on a horse and cowboy hats, you know, so, like, hopefully, you know, it, it gets a good vibe out of that, you know. And, you know, within the New York Film Festival that's coming up soon, you have three of Steve McQueen's anthology, Small Acts. They're broken up into five films. Three of them are going to appear in that one, including one that stars John Boyega and another one that stars Tisha Wright. So we're starting to get, uh, you know, 
movies that have the potential. But I think that's a TV movie, I mean, TV series as opposed to a movie. Um, but, I, you know, I think it's a little early, it being that the goalpost has moved in the Oscar race to February next year. So I think for a lot of these small independent films, um, Carl, some I'm of them maybe I'm waiting. giving him the sign. He's not, he's not taking it yet. What other film is coming out this week? <laughs> this week? <laughs> I'm talking about it's in Toronto. That's in Toronto. Look, uh, I'm asking him about Toronto. Blues, Halle Berry, twenty million dollars. No, Come on, man. No, here's the thing about Halle Berry's movie. It's a work in progress. They're not showing it to the press, so which is why I just not discuss it. So they showed it to Netflix, and I think when it's a work in progress, you can show it to potential buyers, which is well, what they Netflix showed did. it to Netflix, and Netflix threw twenty million dollars on the table and said, "We'll take you know, it." Well, you know, if they've got the money because it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not theater or anything like that, you know, um, no, you know, you wonder, like, like I said before, they're not showing it to the press. Right. So um, it'll do well because Netflix, you know, once it appears on Netflix, a lot of people uh, will see it, you know, because, uh, you know, their stock has gone up and a lot of people subscribe to Netflix throughout this whole COVID uh, pandemic, you know, uh, the question is, is it good enough to hit the theaters? You know, oh. that's what I want to know. First of all, I have Netflix stock. It has not gone up. But <laughs> Look, but uh, yeah, but you know, hey, here's the thing. We we've been here before. You know, let's not forget that Fox Searchlight paid sixteen, seventeen million dollars for uh, Birth of a Nation. Hey, let's hey, hey, forget. hey, hey! Don't be bringing bringing uh, his name into this, man. No, no, what I'm saying, let's not forget at Toronto, Paramount paid somewhere in the near uh, seventeen and a half million dollars. Yes. For uh, uh, for a top five, you yeah. know, they came out of there, you know, so like it's it's you know, so part of that money goes into the marketing as well. So, top five came out, it was a high number at that time as well, not 20, but 13 is nothing to sneeze at, right. and it could have gone higher. But Chris Rock also wanted money thrown in for marketing purposes, don't just buy a film and then toss it out there thinking that we're just gonna go see it, right. gotta help promote it. You know, so like, who knows what the twenty million entails? You know, does it entail like promotion? Does it entail a, a, a two-year film deal with Halle Berry? We don't know. I haven't read the whole details of what the twenty million entails. Right. Um, especially for a film that mostly stars her, the cast are relatively, I wouldn't say unknowns, but they're not big names as of yet. So, um, if if it's a if it's one of those type of movies that could be like a million dollar baby, hey. I'm all for it. Put it out there. Let's see if it gets any sort of awards uh, talk, um, or they could, or they could see it as a commercial film that could do really well for them. Okay. You know, so. All right. So anything we, else happening this week, brother? That was good. I like how you did that, man. Wilson was like, "They're not showing it. They showed it to Netflix. All right, that's good. Netflix, <laughs> Netflix was the audience they needed because they were smart. They wanted that money, so they went up front and said, "We will." The critics can always see it after the fact. We need to make sure it has some distribution. But, you know, but that's the thing. Like, Concrete Cowboy doesn't have distribution. And it's going to be a tough call for, you know, studios, big studios to pick up independent films because, you know, until you know, and from what I hear, Warner Brothers hasn't been tossing out the true domestic numbers for Tenet. We're not seeing what they're making on a daily basis. You right. saw that they made 20 million, but that's from the week before the early showings, not a three day weekend, not a five day weekend. That's that was combined from like a six, seven, eight days, you know. So, like, what's it making overall? You know, obviously, when you make 20 million in one week, you normally just go down from there, you well, know. Let me jump in, Wilson. It's interesting you brought this up because I read that article this morning and they said that you know, all the rival studios are rooting for. Uh, Warner Brothers and Tenet because if that film shows some life that would it would help justify their case to move forward and you're right there are a lot of people upset at Warner Brothers because they're like hey man tell us something be transparent tell us what I mean nobody expects with no New York theaters and no LA theaters we know yeah. your numbers are going to be depressed but don't don't keep us in the dark we're all I mean, this is one of the times that all the studios are all united. Like, hey, man, we need to see somebody on the team win. And you remember for months, I've been telling you, who's going to be the studio that's going to jump out there first and put a big $100 or $200 million film out in theaters? 
And now, you know, I guess you'll talk a little bit about both Candyman and Wonder Woman being delayed because there's this now belief that, hey, man, we can get people back in the theaters. And I'm like, I don't think that's going to work, yeah. but you give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, without New York or L.A., the two biggest market out there, big markets out there, to help your, your box office, right. studios don't have a chance. You know, you, you, you can't be relying on money from Kansas City, Wisconsin, and combined. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, but, like, you know, where are you going to get you it? You're saying that good Candyman. Alabama money's not good, man? You know, and, and Candyman, I, you know, initially there was rumors that could have gone, you know, VOD, but I'm like, nah, I think if, you know, if, if the assumption is that Marvel gave uh, Nia DaCosta the um, – Captain Marvel sequel job based on seeing possibly seeing Candyman, then let us all, you know, then that's a potential that it could be a hit and they want to see her do well with it. Um, They're trying to maximize the Candyman money, man. Don't get mad at them. That's what I'm saying. So like, hey, so put it out because if if it plays well in the theaters next year when it comes out, you know, that's going to only strengthen her case for Candyman 2. You know, Wonder Woman obviously was supposed to have an October release, but with no theaters yet uh, opening, you know, and we're not going to get, New York just decided to do indoor dining on September 30th. And so like, who knows what, how that's going to affect theaters overall, but you know, you can't wait that long to, you know, to think that everybody's going to just come out first weekend, uh, Wonder Woman to, to take a bloodbath at the box office. So it's like, hey, push it back to December. Let's wait and see. Hopefully by then, you know, more people will start going to the theaters, but Outside of Tenant, I don't know of anybody else going to see other movies out there. You know, you're not hearing it. It's like, okay, outside of Tenant, what are the box office numbers for the other films? Is there anyone? I mean, in um, I'm trying to think. I mean, it's it, it 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 is a gamble, and I get it, and I understand it, Wilson. And we've only been talking about this since March. You know, there's this feeling that they're going to bring audiences back to the theaters, but if you remember, and you know from doing the research, they're only allowing 25 percent of theaters to be you know space to be sold so even if people come back to the theaters i personally think that the 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 vod model is probably the stronger one because i heard a rumor this morning that mulan had five million streams uh on its opening weekend so i don't know what that equates to if you do the math at 30 dollars a stream five million that's significant money. I'm saying it's not the money you would make if it was $100 million open into the theater. But right now, that's not a reality and won't be a reality at any point over the next 12 months. We're not going to have 100% of an audience in a movie theater between now and like this time next year. I just don't see it without having a vaccine of any kind. It's just well, not yeah. possible. At the end of the day, you know, you don't want to be in a position, you know, where you're sitting next to somebody and especially in the theater where it's a closed environment, you know, restaurants and everywhere else can have at least, you know, a window open or whatever, you know, in the theater, you know, all it takes is one person to cough or sneeze and then somebody else starts panicking or, you know, well, all not it takes even that, Wilson, what about a laugh or saying something like, or an emotion, a, a part in the film where you laughing? I mean, anything, any movement. You know, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's going to be a, a tough call, you know, to see where these things play at, you know, and how they play out. Um, especially, you know, when you, when theaters, are, like you said, 25%, 50%, you know, how, how does that work? You know, like, how can you, like, yeah, you say $20 million, it's like, yeah, out of w which theater made the most money, you know? What's the max that you allow to the theater, like 50 people, you know, and how, and how were they spaced out? You know, um, and, and you know, and theaters are not going to want to bring in independent films that they're going to have to work hard just to bring in an audience. Tenant had the, uh, the marketing, but what happens to, with the smaller films? The smaller films are like, hey, you know, let's go VOD and try to work that marketing because the small films are the ones. You know, of all these movies that we're talking about coming out of the festivals, the question is, are you actually going to go see it in the theaters, or would you rather just get it home? We've had six months of getting used to watching movies online, whether you bought it for a certain amount or whether it, you know, it was streamed, whether it's on Netflix or Amazon and stuff like that, that like you're more comfortable now because there is no vaccine. They're like, I don't want to go out, you know, you'll go out and, you know, sporadically, you know, and it's only going to get colder in the winter. 
You know, the winter's going to get colder. You know, we don't know. I think everything has, like, let's see, you know, when edu- when the school systems start, I think by the end of the month, you'll know how it is with the schools. You know, you're getting a case here, case there. Um, and, you know, so far, we haven't heard anything through sports, you know, because it's the bubble when they're playing in there. But, hey, football's about to start. And let's see how that plays out um, to see whether or not, you know, the owners want to let a certain amount of people go into the, uh, into the stadiums. You know, it's like, what is, what are the giants doing? Are, 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 can anybody go there nope. or no? No, nope. so, no, no, no audiences in, in, in the greater New York metropolitan area. So no jets, no giants, no Rutgers, no big 10, no nothing. So well, the ACC is playing except for that Virginia and Virginia tech just got canceled because they had uh, Virginia tech had a major outbreak of COVID. So it, everything is, everything gets pushed back. Everything is pushed back. Why even so? So again, like I said, this is a situation that bears watching, but I am, I am willing to gamble with you, Wilson, that uh, you're going to hear more in the next month or so, you're going to hear more movies being pushed back because there's this expectation and there, I mean, California is in a really bad spot now between COVID as well as these wildfires. Mm-hmm. New York, you know, that's they, you know, there's kind of a wait and see mentality, but I don't know, brother. This is this is risky right now. I think the better model is to try to, you know, like Universal, uh, you know, has Peacock now. Disney has Disney Plus. Netflix already has its streaming service. I think all these studios need to develop their own personal streaming models as a way to get their films that are out there and then figure out how to write it off to understand that you can put an asterisk by a movie right now and say that it came out during a time of the pandemic and you have to adjust the grosses to kind of understand that that this is not business as usual so that's kind of what what i would do but who am i i'm just the guy that hosts uh, hosts a, a weekly show <laughs> like i said every you know I, the good thing about your show is that everything is nothing's the same every week something's different you oh, know absolutely. everything's the, you know like something's getting moved up something's pushed back you know um and all we can do is try to tell the audience what's happening so that they are aware and keep plugging the project because the projects are completed and it needs an audience one way or the other, whether it's on streaming or whether it's in the theaters, you know, so that way they know, you know, we have a lot of uh, black films left to play um, down the road, you know, whether it's respect or, uh, um, you know, not the James Bond film, respect you have well, the james uh, bond film is one that's coming out that's that uh i forget the title of it but uh it's supposed to be dropping all time today yep you've got you've that. got you've got uh um, lee daniels um uh, the united states versus busy holiday netflix has a couple of movies including jingle jingle and ma rainey's black bottom mm-hmm. you know um there's there's a lot of movies left to play to be talked about now the question is how is it you know netflix you know they're going to be all right you know <laughs> but every other place is like okay how do they work it out you know like where is the audience you know like you know it's good to hear the buzz because it creates awareness but now it's a question of like how do people get to see it and you know because the goal post has moved to february then you start getting into like you know you, you're not having theaters where you're going to have screenings for sag members so how do you market to, to those people so that they can see it? You know, uh, we got a long road ahead, you know, but, it, you know, hopefully, you know, we can start seeing movies and I think they're creating more drive-in theaters, uh, which I've not done yet. Like I said, until New York and LA are back in the, in, the, in the mix of things, it's tough to call how everything is playing elsewhere. All right. Well, Wilson, before we let you get out of here, man, tell people where they can read your content, man. Because, you know, as I told you, I think you do an amazing job on a week-in, week-out basis. You can find me over at Black Feminine TV, which is what you use for Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, you know, uh, and as well as the site. You know, like all we can do is keep updating you what's on TV, what's on film, and anywhere else. All right, sir. And as we tell you, you're at the top of our show every week, man. And we appreciate you coming through. And um, I realize you're not covering the festival, but please <laughs> enjoy the content that yes. you're not covering. <laughs> well, you know, it's like, you know, I, you know, like, you know, 
individual public says, you know, they want me to give them my uh, two cents. Uh, 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 don't explain. Don't explain. You're too much. You're doing too much right too much. now. <laughs> I'll see you next week, bro. <laughs> You'll get it. You will. Right. Take care. All right, man, Charles, that, of course, is Wilson Morales, who may or may not be watching films from the festival that we're not covering. I'm not covering it either, so I'm not watching anything from Toronto. Again, I I just don't want to have COVID come through my internet. You are funny, man. You are (laughs) absolutely funny, man. No, I I think think it's a, a really special kind of circumstance and you know every week and I know sometimes we sound like a broken record man that but 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 I have been consistent about one thing the only thing that I said that I wouldn't do and I and I was my hand got forced um was uh-huh. that I had to I eventually uh-huh. go to a movie but that was not something and it and it was really you know as I'm we're waiting on Melissa Hayslip to, to call in on our Zoom um, I'll repeat, you know, for people who weren't here the week that we did Tenet, that, you know, you, you're in a movie, a colleague of ours, Travis Hobson, showed up with a mask and gloves. I didn't understand the gloves in a the movie theater. Uh, but you're trying to watch the movie. And of course, you and I both wear glasses. So you've got that condensation kind of issue where you're trying to watch the movie and your glasses fog up and you're sitting there, and of course you're isolated because you're not sitting next to anybody. So you're like, okay, I got all this room. Uh, watching the movie, I got cloudy glasses. I can. <laughs> yeah, man, it, it is a it is a very. I, I'll I'll say it this way, man. I mean, as a person who who screens movies as well, Charles, you know, it's kind of an experience to to kind of to to be with colleagues and to see folks and to talk to people. And, you know, six or seven months have now gone by and, you know, their colleagues I haven't seen. Um, it, it, it's just, uh, I, I'm, and I'm not crying the blues because I know everybody else is going through a similar sort of a situation, but it is very strange, man. I mean, you know, we've got a film festival that I attend every year coming up next month and I don't know what the deal is going to be. Um, I think and we're talking specifically about the Middleburg Film Festival. I think there's going to be a blend, Charles, of some events on, you know, out at the theater in Middleburg or out at the facility in Middleburg, the hotel. And then I think they're going to do some virtual stuff. So I haven't heard a thing. And I need to find out because we normally do a panel there every year. And I don't know even how it will impact the films that they're going to show. And I think their lineup as a rule usually comes out the end of September uh, based on stuff that's either played at TIFF or stuff that's played at Venice or stuff that's played at Telluride. And since Telluride was virtual this year, (laughs) TIFF is virtual. (laughs) I'm like, man, I don't, so I don't know. I don't understand. I mean, mean, Middlebury's not the only one. I I know we just heard, I just heard the DC DC Shorts Festival, which I'm a a judge on, is is going virtual this year. uh, And it's going to start this weekend. Um, I haven't heard about Urban World. I haven't, I mean, Urban World, I mean, they haven't even said anything. What are what are they doing? Who knows? So it's it's the whole the whole thing, and which brings me to the point is what's going to happen with the Oscars when these films don't get out to be seen? Like, you know, because a lot of this these festivals generate the buzz that these uh, uh, movies need to get into the Oscars consideration sometimes, and and what's going to happen? I don't know. It's it's it everything is crazy. Everything is crazy. Yeah, man. I, I just think we're we're living in a, a time that um, you know there's a lot of instability in our country. There's a lot of uh, a lot of unknown factors as around around to to health and how COVID is being handled. And I mean, you know, you, people think about COVID, and this is as I said, it's been going on since March. We had an amazing week in the news this week where we found out some revelations, which I think a lot of people are familiar with and sort of thought that was the case anyway. But we now have over 100, and this is as of our show this week. So by the time we come on next week, this number will be higher. Uh, 190,000 people who were here in March at the start of this outbreak 
are no longer with us. 190,000 in six months. So when we talk about, you know, there's instability, you know, in the week we've heard, you know, there are film sets that have been shut down and then they try to shoot around it and then they shut them down again. Uh, You know, India, I was reading this week, has had a huge outbreak. And you go, well, why is that news for us? Well, again, we're talking about a global motion picture industry. And if there's any part of the world that's shut down where movies can't be shown, whether it's South America, Europe, uh, the Caribbean, you know, wherever films can't be shown, money can't be made. So I don't, I'm assuming, and I don't know whether Canada is up since, and, and, are they showing films? I'm assuming since they have a film festival. I'm, I'm assuming that they are because of what I heard was their rates are so low that they, they're not even concerned, which is why their borders are closed to us and yeah. that uh, we couldn't have a, attend a Toronto film festival this year that, and they are in the theater. So, you know, Congratulations to them. I, I, I wish we could be the same way. Our theaters are open right. here in Maryland now, and D, I don't think DC is open yet. But um, we're still not going to generate the money that's missing from a New York or a Los Angeles, or and or you know. So I mean, we hey, I want to go to the movies. I, I, I and I'm sure pretty soon we're going to start hearing about screening movies coming out. Um, I'm just not sure whether I'm comfortable with going to see a movie in a theater yet. I I, I joke with you about Tenet. I I probably would have gone to see that one, especially under the conditions that you were in. But um, when we start having those regular press junkets where everybody's there, I I don't know. I don't know. All right. Well, we got plenty of time to talk about that. That situation remains fluid, man. But let us bring our guest on who is a filmmaker who was born in Boston, raised in the U.S. Virgin Islands, which is one of my favorite spots, Connecticut as well as New York. She's a Chaz and Roger Ebert producing fellow and an alumna of the Film Independence Project Evolve Firelight Media's Documentary Lab and the uh, Producers Guild of America's Diversity Workshop. And without any further ado, because I got a lot to talk about this young lady, this is Melissa Hazlett, who I love is, is dialed in from home and her and her married name shows up. This is wild men. I will change it just to no, say. No, 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 you good, you good. Yep, that's, no, that's my, watch that's this. my account. So while she's changing this, let me also say that yesterday she was on Good Morning America and it yeah. is so nice to have her on this show today. How are you, my love? I'm doing great. How are you? It's so good to be here. Charles, there's Melissa for you. Melissa, wonderful color that you have going on with you today. We are matchy 2020 <laughs> twins. <laughs> now, now, before we talk to the director of Mr. Soul, I just want to tell one story about that's very memorable, a night me and Melissa hung out at Sundance. Oh boy, here we go. I am, I am walking down it, this, is it PG rated? Is it PG rated? It, well, well, we'll see in a second. Okay. Um, I'm walking up Main Street, you know, on a cold night, like a Friday or Saturday night. Who do I see screams my name out from across the street? Tim. I'm like, hey, what's up? He's like, I'm going to this party. Let's go down here to the Black House. So I'm like, okay, cool. I don't know if I can get in, but then I'm with Melissa. So of course I'm going to get in. So we go down to the Black House. The line is long. Melissa goes, I got another party. Follow me. So I'm like, bet. We go into the party. Melissa gets me in. Ava DuVernay is on the floor doing selfies. You remember all of this. She's taking selfies with, with hundreds of people. I look to the left. My good buddy Stephanie Elaine is dancing on a speaker. I said, I'm Melissa, you the woman. Though. I'm the speaker, on though. The speaker. I'm like, Melissa, you the woman. <laughs> <laughs> that was hot. So, that was for dear white people. When that it was, was. That was a great party. That so that and that was really my people. first Lena Wade, Stephanie Elaine. So Lena you Wade. have solidified. You are a part of the folklore of Sundance, <laughs> Melissa Hazlett. That's all it took, just a party. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> look, look, look. Yeah. <laughs> um, <Party>. yeah. <laughs> because I had watched so many movies. That was literally, literally the first night I'd gone out 
to experiment the night experience the nightlife. So I had a ball and I wanted to always thank you for that because I tell people that story <laughs> all the time. Don't get me in trouble because I'm going to like be known as a line jumper. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, in, in, in the culture we come in, you know, the beautiful people are the are the line jumpers. There's nothing wrong with being a line jumper. because Hey, I've been listen, some... speaking of, one time this is completely not film related, but I was in the um, Martha's Vineyard at the African American Film Festival. Shout out to Stephanie, Stephanie Floyd. Floyd. Yep. Yep. And yep. it was the summer of 2018 when Mr. Soul did screen at the festival. And we were all waiting in line at Backdoor Donuts. It was close to one o'clock. And so, you know, that's when they closed. And here comes this tall, very leggy, what I thought was a young woman with a huge entourage behind her. And she just cuts right in front of the line. And there must be like 300 of us waiting in line, hoping not to miss the cutoff. And then we're all like, what the heck? Where is she? Who does she think she is? And she goes up, she goes right to the front and gets her donuts. She turns around to leave and it's, Malia Obama. What? <laughs> we're like, oh, okay, bet, bet. What's this look? Okay, bet, bet, bet. It's, it's Malia. It's okay. We can line down. <laughs> hey, I, I, I got it. I have another story of and a person. Those people behind her were not friends. Right, 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 right. With Secret Service dressed up in street clothes. So. But I was going to also say, Melissa, I've gone to parties at Sundance and have stood outside in parties I couldn't get into. And there were some people who you know who couldn't get in either. So I was like, <laughs> and I'm not gonna name them because I'm not gonna put you on the spot. But there was some high Don't profile. Me out. I, I oh. still have some parties to go to whenever we get out of this, you know, quarantine. Yes, ma'am. They're gonna be some mad parties we need to go to. So, I'm well, sister, down for the party. Well, I'm sister, down for party. oh, go ahead, Charles. I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> I'm down for the parties. Let's go. Oh, Melissa's the person to be for that. <laughs> but um, I want to talk to this sister about her documentary. And I remember when you were putting this together and you had your GoFundMe program, I am proud to say that I donated and I teased you because I was like, I still haven't seen this movie. I gave money to this movie. <laughs> but Mr. Soul is an amazing, uh, it, it, I call it a testament because you know, this is a film that happened literally across the water from where I lived. I lived in Newark, New Jersey. So hey, shout out to Newark. We didn't, yeah, Oscar we didn't Rocco, have, shout out. I guess I didn't have PBS that could get me Mr. Soul uh, back in the late 60s, early 1970s. I was stunned at this level of a show, this variety show that your uncle created yeah. that was absolutely amazing. They had a who's who of guests on at the time. So for people who may have been under a rock and don't know what, what uh, Ellis Hayslip who hosted and produced, created, talk to the people and explain to them what Mr. S uh, what Soul was. Right, okay, so there right. is a show called Soul, and just so not to confuse anyone, because it's a little confusing, our film is called Mr. Soul, and I'll right. explain that in a minute. But Soul itself was a series, an amazing, pioneering, groundbreaking, revolutionary television series. It was the first Black Tonight Show. It was a show that was for us, by us, from 1968 to 1973. So that was a really revolutionary moment because on the onset of, uh, you know, uh, well, on the heels of the civil rights movement, Jim Crow, uh, Martin Luther King had just been assassinated. It was a tumultuous time in the nation. We were pushing back. We were, we were rioting. We were, we were uprising, as we like to call it, protesting. Uh, very much like what's happening now, pushing against the system, demanding to be seen. And so that moment created an opportunity for a television show called Soul, which really was about the true Black experience, not the rioting and the looting and the criminalization of Blackness, but the beauty of Blackness and the beauty of Black art and Black love, Black strength, Black sister and brotherhood. This had never been seen on television before. So imagine this is 1968 and this is PBS and this show comes on and just changes the face of television as we know it. It brought diversity, inclusion. It brought, like I said, black love, black excellence. And we needed that at the time, just like we need it now. Now the host of the show happens to be my uncle, so hence the personal connection, but Ellis Hazlip was a pioneer. He saw a greater vision for blackness and he was in love 
with our blackness in all of its forms. So it not only was soul a platform, well, it was really like a vehicle for African-American artistry, but it was also a platform for political expression and the fight for social justice. So you don't usually see that on a late night TV show. <laughs> You're not going to see that on the Tonight Show. But no. Ellis Hayes have wanted to show the full beauty and excellence of black art, black politics, black disagreement, black love, black strength, and artists that you've never seen, music that you've never heard live. So on the show, we're talking to people like, who, had, who hadn't been on TV before, right? But Earth, Wind & Fire, Al Green, Nikki Giovanni interviewing James Baldwin. But then you also had incredible artists like Stevie Wonder, The Spinners, um, The Black Panthers were on there. Black Ivory was on there. It was just a huge display. It was like a bevy. I like to think of it as a time capsule because it really shows all these artists in their prime. Um, Gladys Knight, Bill Withers, then jazz artists like McCoy Tyner who just passed away and Bill Withers. They were on the same episode. Unbelievable. Uh, and what this meant to black culture and how this pushed the culture forward. So our film is about this moment and looking at it in this light, especially during this time of mm -hmm. protest and reclaiming our place in the nation um, and fighting Black Lives Matter and fighting for equality, this is a moment for Mr. Soul. So I'm so glad to be able to bring it out in a digital space, in a virtual space, so we can all watch it from home and be safe, but we can be uplifted and we can be reminded of our greatness. Right. No, but I was going to say, and I agree, because you know, you stole my thunder, because you know, uh -oh. your presentation is flawless. So I was going to say. <laughs> you you asked say, me to speak. I just speak from my heart. <laughs> no, no, I mean, and, and I appreciate it. But I, you know, the thing that, that I thought that Ellis did that was really unique to me, because mm -hmm. even years later, after we watch shows like Flip Wilson, and we yeah. saw Arsenio Hall later on yeah. shows, the, the, how he weaved the poetry in. Like there were some episodes of, of Soul that, you know, it would be Nikki Giovanni and like several other poets on stage. Yes, and then Sonia like, Sanchez. Yeah, Sonia Sanchez. I mean, it was, it was Mari Evans. He had, he had Nelson. on there. It was, oh, it was amazing how he, he kind of conceived these episodes and mm -hmm. came up with these different ideas to encompass the total black experience of that yes. time. And the thing also is that it was undiluted and it was unapologetically black because it was coming from a black perspective. It wasn't from like the white gaze or a white lens. It wasn't a, you know, anthropo anthropological, right. like, no, oh, let's look at the back black people on display. It wasn't like that at all. It was like, here we are in our richness, in our diversity, in our complexity, we are not a monolithic people. We love, we sing, we dance, we argue, we come together. We have, we have political aspirations. We are coming together as a nation. All of this had not been seen before. There were what they call public affairs shows, which dealt with the news. And those were like Black Journal, uh, Say Brother out of WGBO in Boston, mm -hmm. or even Like It Is with Gil Noble. They were advancing the news and the agenda of the people, but soul was about the culture mm -hmm. and it was for the culture. You know, that's our hashtag right now for the culture, but this was real. This was like, it was urgent because we needed to redefine ourselves on this, on this American landscape as belonging here with a message and a culture and an art form that was unique to us. Charles? What's so amazing is that, it, it, and like you said before, that before this, it, anything that you had seen about Black was scripted and seen through the lens of white uh, writers. Or, and, and now we had this genuine piece of real Black history happening right before our eyes on public television, no, nonetheless, that it was a phenomenal work. And I just want to know, can you, can you speak a little bit to how he got how he got to get it started. Of course. I think there were several reasons why we needed a soul. The, the, the nation was erupting, first of all, especially with the um, assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But it also exposed a moment in which people realized 
And the powers that be in programming and television realized that television was completely white and that the media had weaponized African Americans in this country and, and associated us with something that was negative. Everything on television was negative. It was about the, the riots. It was about poverty. It was about garbage not being picked up in Harlem. You know, it was about the struggle. And yes, those things existed, but that's never been the totality of our, of our reality. You know, we're not just poverty. We're not just struggle. We're so much more to who we are. There's a depth of richness in the black community and in the black expression. And so Ellis Hazlip was answered the call when WNET uh, was responding to the Kerner Commission report, which said that there are two worlds emerging, one black and the one white, and the media is largely responsible for this. So a very smart, um, forward thinking, white gentleman at WNET who had the power to create a space for soul reached out to Ellis because he knew him and knew that he was like a producer and had worked in the theatrical department and had had a lot of um had his finger on the pulse and said you know can can we make the black tonight show and Ellis Hazel said uh-uh <laughs> that's not what we need but I'll take the opportunity I'm gonna run with it and I'm gonna give you know I'm gonna let you finish but I'm gonna do something that's more deeper, more controversial, and more appropriate for the black community. And so that's how Soul was born. And because it was the beginning of public television, literally like the Public Broadcast Act, Broadcasting Act had just been formed, it was the beginning of this system, this network of, of public stations around the country. So because everybody was getting their footing, I think Ellis could slip in there with his agenda you know, also it was pre-FCC. There was no seven second delay. So this was a moment where you could make something extraordinary <laughs> and not be stopped. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he said, okay, okay, okay. And he did that, you know, and that's what's remarkable about it because he was such a quiet revolutionary, but the result is loud as hell. Oh, excuse me. Let me not- um, Oh, no, no, you're good. Loud as hell could work. <laughs> You didn't you didn't pull a Nima from last week, man. I had to make a phone call like, yeah, Nima dropped a couple of these and these. Oh, a couple of bombs, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. But we love Nima. But you know it's family now, so we get it. Is, it is. It's family. You good. So so question for you, uh, Melissa. How can people see uh, Mr. Soul right now? Yeah, we decided to bring it to the people right now on virtual screens. Important to stay safe and stay home. Mm -hmm. And honoring that, you know, no one's going to the movies right now, but we still need to be creative and we still need to feel like we're part of a community. So we thought, well, let's bring it to the people virtually. What that means is, you know how you have Netflix and you have your other screening right. hubs. What we're doing is we're partnering with, with theaters that have screening hubs all around the country. So if you go to our website, which is mrsoulmovie.com, www.mrsoulmovie.com slash screenings, or go to the screenings tab, you'll see a whole list of theaters there. And those are cinemas around the country, maybe your local cinema, maybe your favorite movie theater. You just click on it and you can buy your tickets right there. And it'll stream right in your home and you can watch it for up to 72 hours. You can watch as much as you want. And it's only $12, which is great. So the whole right. family can watch it, or you can watch it on any of your devices. Our idea was how can we bring this to the people and give people something to celebrate during this dark time? You know, we, we really need to remember, we need to be reminded of our greatness and we need to, this is like a love affair to black culture. And I think we need that right now. Yeah, it's very times. very relevant. Melissa Hayslip, she's good. <laughs> 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 we have been celebrating uh, women, women, uh, black women directors all month long, and I am so happy that you had taken the opportunity to share your story, to share your film, and uh, I can't wait until after all this is over because we got more hanging to do. I have not seen you since, was it two years ago when we yes. were at AFI Silver? We were at AFI Silver. Oh, yeah. um, and it was Color of Conversation, that wonderful film series, also curated by Stephanie and Floyd Rance. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Soul was opening that particular film festival. And we were at a party for... Um, oh, um, oh uh, uh, 
Sorry to bother you. Sorry to bother you. I had moderated the panel. That's right. That's right. Exactly. So there's a wonderful, what, what is the technology called? Boomerang of me, you, and Stephanie? Yes. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, Charles, see, I'm telling you, you got to hang with me, man. I, you know, I know some folks, man. <laughs> Melissa, Melissa, I want to thank you, though. Um, and don't be a stranger. And I'm definitely going to call you because we're going to need you back for some stuff in the, in the, in the ensuing months. Um, good luck with Mr. Soul. Fantastic film. Go out and check it out now. Give them the website one more time, Melissa. Yeah. So the website is www.mrsoulmovie.com. And you can go to the screenings page on the website and you can click on it and watch the film. Melissa Hazlett, thank you, young lady. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you guys. Oh, man. She's on the same show Nico was on last week. That's what's up. Uh, hey, shout out to my women directors. Black women directors, what's up? Come Lisa, through. Look, look, Lisa Cortez will be here next week. So we're going to That's my girl. Going. That's my girl. Yeah. We went to college together. Well, I'll let you uh, look, look. That's my girl, too. She'll be here. So <laughs> All right. just, we'll, we'll send you some information next week to check it out. Fantastic. I Melissa, can't wait. You take care, dear. All right. I'll be in touch. Thank you. All right. Bye. All right. And of course, that was Melissa Hazlett. Uh, who joined us and you know we're about to do some reviews right now before we get out of here Melissa's gonna hang out. Okay, Melissa, you can hang out and listen to these reviews He's like, uh, are you gonna oh, you want me to click off? You want me to click off? I mean you could I mean okay. you know, but all I'm gonna do is do some reviews right now and That's gonna be about it for this week <laughs> All right, peace hang, out. Okay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, Charles, you know what we do man during this time man. We got two movies this week um, but let me read the script because, you know, this is one of the things I used to get on top of you about every week. All right, so welcome back to our final segment. And as usual, this week's reviews are brought to you by thefilmgordon.com. Experience, experience film through the eyes of a true film addict, Charles Kirkland. Uh, check out all of our film coverage at thefilmgordon.com. Now, this week, uh, there are two new films. One is a Netflix film. The other is a Peacock film. So we will tackle the Netflix film first. Uh, this film is causing quite the uproar, as we, tell, we said earlier, which tells the story of young woman, one young girl's challenge of self-discovery. And that film is called Cuties, uh, which is a French coming-of-age comedy drama written and directed by a French Sen Senegalese and boy, I do not want to mess this woman's name up. Um, Just her. Yeah, the, the director, yeah, I don't want to mess her name up. And I'm, I'm being very respectful because I haven't even listened to the pronunciation one time to, to even try to say what this name is. But this is her uh, feature directorial debut. Uh, the film played at Sundance early this year. Netflix picked it up. And... I'll just say this, man, uh, and I'll say this in my review, but the plot revolves around a French Senegalese girl with a traditional Muslim upbringing who is caught between traditional values and internet culture. The film is intended to criticize the hypersexualization uh, hyper of pre-adolescence girls. Um, I will say this, that is a part of the huge problem of this film. Um, one of our colleagues, Christopher Llewellyn Reed, wrote a post this morning, Charles, where he got in trouble because uh, he gave the film a positive review and the Breitbart folks put him on their list. So a lot of the conservative publications are going after any liberal critic they feel who is giving this, and I'm talking about critics, who are giving the film a positive review. So come for me next because... Um, I had an opportunity to watch this film, and I'm just going to be as real as possible because you know how I do on this show, man. I don't, I pull no punches when it comes to my reviews and my thoughts. Um, this was a movie that told the story, as I said, of this young girl who is going to, I guess, she's 11 years old, so she's probably in the sixth grade. Sixth grade. And she's going to school with a bunch of young girls who are... They, they have aspirations to want to be dancers, but they're picking up on the Western culture, right? So they're trying to dress like, you know, uh, young, I mean, dress like teenage girls, even though they're 11. 
Um, and you, you know, our parents back in the day would classify it as you classify it as you're trying to be fast. You remember this phrase, you're trying to grow up fast. So she is living, you know, in a very repressed sort of a, an, an environment and she sees these girls being free, being fun, having fun. Um, I think the, the point that the director is trying to make with the story is that a lot of these young girls are losing their innocence at an earlier age, trying to be advanced and be an older. So I get the point of the film, but I will admit Charles as a, a guy in his fifties, that there are some scenes in this movie where the camera spends a little too much time on these, these prepubescent <laughs> girls in, in a way that does not make me comfortable. And I've had this experience at Sundance, but I've watched movies um, and I never forget, I can't remember the name of it, but the film that starred Common and um, what is her name? Uh, about the girl who got sexually abused by her, by her coach. And, it, and this movie reminded me of that, how I sat in the theater and I was deep in my seat like, oh man, this is not good at all. That's how it felt watching Cuties. But I think the third act sort of redeems itself to kind of drive home the point that the director is trying to make. But I will say this much, for all of the people who are criticizing the film for that hypersexualization, that's very real. <laughs> so I, wouldn't, I would not be doing my job if I didn't tell you that it's not the kind of film you'd watch that there's going to be a lot of conversation around this film, either positive, positively or negatively. But I like the film. I gave the film a B. I thought Cuties is a film that is probably being criticized a lot from people who have not had an opportunity to see it and are critiquing it based on what other people are saying about it versus watching it themselves. And even in the watching, you got to watch it all the way through because if you watch half of it and tap out, You'd be like, I see, I told you. But Cuties is a bold film. It's an award-winning film, and it deserves an audience. It's playing on Netflix right now. Check it out. Which leads me to our last film of the day, um, a film, Charles, that I told you about earlier that I have really been waiting a, long, a long time to see. And this film is much like what Melissa talked about with uh, Soul. This film also takes place in 1968 which is probably one of the most tumultuous years in the history of our country. And it's simply entitled The Sit-In, Harry Belafonte hosts The Tonight Show. Now in 1968, entertainer and activist Harry Belafonte took over The Tonight Show for one historic week, introducing a fractured changing country to, uh, a country to itself alongside legendary guests like Aretha Franklin, Dr. the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Wilt Chamberlain, Paul Newman, Robert Kennedy, Frida Payne, Sidney Poitier, Diane Carroll, Bill Cosby, Dion Warwick. Uh, it was like <laughs> the, the all-star team of black entertainers and, 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 and folks in thought all converged on one week. So before I talk about this film, you know, you just heard Melissa Hayeslip talking about Soul, which was created in 1968 in a year that it's ironic because two months after this show, uh, this week of shows, we lost both Bobby Kennedy and Dr. King. So it's, it's very relevant that, you know, a lot of this stuff is happening during this time. Even looking at our time now, as we talk about a lot of the racial unrest, people talk about it being akin to 1968. So that was a time, as you heard Melissa talk about, that television was, was, was all white. It was all white, right? So the fact that Johnny Carson, six years into his run in The Tonight Show, wanted to tackle civil rights issues, but didn't feel like he was qualified to do it, knew Harry Belafonte well and knew and, and called him and convinced him to come on guest host for a week and bring these issues to the table. And what you have, uh, you know, if you think Soul is a testament, this one week where you have a lot of people who actually appeared on Soul later on, uh, you know, spending this historic week with Harry Belafonte, it is the, this is, you know, Soul and 
uh, the sit-in uh, are both shows that I think people should should bring these shows home, get their families around, and let them experience this culture as it occurred. Uh, you know, back in back in this this special time of 1968. Um, I mean, you don't even have to talk to me to tell you that there's nothing negative about this, about either of these shows. You know, either of these documentaries. Um, this one on, on Harry Belafonte, I thought was amazing. And I also will say to, to you, Charles, that both of these were events that occurred or shows that occurred that I had no knowledge of. And there are tons of stories about, you know, pride and African-American achievement that I think people just need to see, man. So the sit-in, Harry Belafonte hosts the night show. I thought it was absolutely amazing, stunning, an amazing testament to our work. Um, I give this one an A. Um, I really like this a lot, and I and I encourage you because I'm running out of time, and I can't. I don't really want to ramble on because it's an hour and about. I think it's 75 minutes in total for this one. So I encourage you to go check out uh, this. It's on Peacock right now. You can watch it for free. Just register and sign up. So that's what I have for you guys this week. So Charles, as I tell people in closing at the event, at the end of every show, uh, before we even get to that, let me just thank Wilson Morales from blackfilmandtv.com who joined us this week to give us the entertainment rundown. We also thank Melissa Hazlett and my partner in crime on keeping it real with film Gordon, his, uh, you know, his uh, Washington football club will debut tomorrow. My team <laughs> plays on Monday night. So in closing, as we tell you, please see something good at the movies. We've given you a couple of options. If you want to stay home, you can, you know, stream the sit-in, Harry Belafonte, hosted, the Tonight Show hosted by Harry Belafonte. I think I might have got the title wrong. You can also check out Mr. Soul if you want to check it out. And also, Cuties is on Netflix. So you guys got some options. Charles, until next week, man, great job, my friend. Uh, we'll be back for more as we celebrate Black women directors all month long. Next week, Lisa Cortez will join the show. Uh, you don't want to miss that. And we will see you guys next week. Next week, you guys take care. Charles, I'm out, man. Good job, Thanks, brother. Man.